Signal gasoline. Let every traffic signal remind you, you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. The Signal Oil Company and your neighborhood signal dealer bring you another curious story by The Whistler. Tonight, what makes a murderer? the whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Murder is a peculiar affair. All it needs in many cases is the right pressure, the right set of circumstances, the right opportunity and an otherwise respectable member of the community becomes a killer. If you tried to explain that to Arthur Winslow, he wouldn't have understood. If you told him he was in a fair way to become a murderer in a few months, he would have looked at you strangely. For Arthur was respectable, solid, exactly like a hundred thousand other respectable, solid Jersey commuters. His life was a pretty drab affair. Part of it was the office, J. Simmons and Company, American investment broker. American Farm Light, 7 and an eighth, no change. 7 and an eighth, no change. American Tell and Tell, 179 and an eighth, off an eighth. AT&T, 179 and an eighth, off an eighth. American Tobacco, 77, up one. 77, up one. Uh, better leave it there, Arthur. 5 o'clock. Got to make that 519. Why? Mm-hmm. Why do we have to make the 519, Stanley? Why? Why, Arthur, because we always do. Why is that a good reason? What? I mean, do you think because we've always made the 519 that we ought to keep on making it the rest of our lives? Is, is something wrong, Arthur? Uh, maybe, I don't know. I've been thinking, Stanley. Huh? For ten years now, you and I have been analyzing investment securities eight hours a day, catching the 519 every night, arriving home in East Orange promptly at 622, kissing our wives at approximately 650, eating dinner at exactly 7, reading the evening paper, and then going to bed. Well? Well, it's a little like... like death, isn't it, Stanley? What in the world gotten into you, Arthur? I've got a book here. Hey, hey, take a look. Book? Huh. It's a novel. Got me to thinking. Moon and Sixpence. Hmm. It's about a man like us, Stanley. Mm -hmm. A man who got fed up with the 519 and dished the whole works. Well, what did he do? He took a chance. He walked out, just picked up his hat, and went off to the South Sea. You mean he... he just left his family? Mm. They preferred the 519. Huh. Well, I can't say that I approve. No, I didn't think you would. Well, you better hurry along, Stanley. You'll miss your train. Yes, but what about you? Well, tonight, just for a change, I believe I'll catch the 5.55. Just for a change, Arthur, after ten years. You walk slowly down Broad Street, deliberately casual, noticing the swarms of hurrying commuters objectively, as if for the first time. It's pleasant strolling along like this, taking your time stopping to look in a window now and then. Finally, you stop at a cigar stand. Have you, uh, you got a pack of cigarettes? Well, if you can smoke them. <laughs> yeah. Here. 18 cents. Hmm? 25 and 50. Thanks. Yeah. Say, uh, uh, what's that back there? Oh, you interested in, uh, bang tails? What? Bang tails. Horses. Opening up Pimlico tomorrow. Hey, uh, come here. Sure. Now, there's the board. Take your pick. Current art in this color. Huh. Pink Lady. Mike the Third. Big Bonanza. Moon and Sixpence. Hey, what's that? Uh, moon and Sixpence. Top horse in a parlay. Don't know nothing about them, though. Parley? What's that? You, 
You don't know what a parlor is? No, I don't. Oh. Well, okay. Well, in that parlor there, you got three horses, see? Yeah. Now, you put your doe on Blue Bonnet in the first. Wow. If he comes in, the doe goes on Glue Worm in the second. If he comes in, the works rides on Moon and Sixpence in the third. Get it? We interrupt this program. The B-29s are back in the war. The super fortresses, which have been the major factor in bringing Japan to her knees these past few weeks, have dropped high explosive and incendiary bombs on the Marifu Railroad Yard, the first purely rail target to be hit in Japan. There was no Jap fighter or flak opposition. It was the first heavy bombing Japan has received since last Saturday, the 11th. And during the three days that the very heavy bombers have rested at their bases, the diplomats have taken over to consider Japan's reluctant offer to surrender. However, the diplomats haven't done so well. If the tension here in the Pacific is any standard of judgment, the Japs have succeeded in conducting a fairly effective war of nerves against us by their failure to reply to the Allies. So now, General Spot's strategic bombers are back over Japan dropping explosive reminders to the Nipponese people they had better surrender or else. It is a feeling here that the super forts were sent to Japan as an allied prod for Hirohito and his ministers to make up their minds. If they don't, Japan can ex expect more of the same treatment. As a matter of fact, today's bombing is continuing right now. More and more bombers are over the Jap homeland, and the bombs away signal will come back to Guam many more times today. The Marifu rail yards and shops were hit by the 313th wing of the 20th Air Force, based Antinian. Three B-29 groups planted the area with high explosive bombs. The rail yards form one of the most critical bottlenecks in the Japanese railroad system, serving the double track rail line that runs from Tokyo to Kobe and along the inland sea of Japan. Interruption of traffic on this line will first of all affect the Jap oil supply, and more important, it will affect the critical Jap food shortage already desperate in Japan's big city. The strategic air forces are not playing tag in this operation. Japan right now is being hit and being hit hard. The process will continue until we receive that notification of unconditional surrender or wrest it from the hands of the emperor himself when we take his imperial castle in Japan itself. If they want it that way, that's the way they're going to get it. And this is Bill Downs and Guam returning you to CBS. But that's almost a year's salary, and you're holding it right in your hand. You just walk the streets for an hour or two, thinking, gradually realizing what happened. It can mean a new car, new dresses for Ethel, and more of the same. Or it can mean... Yes, Arthur, if you took a chance. It's crazy, it's wild. But if you act before you think... You walk into a phone booth in the financial center lobby. <coughs> The South Seas. No more figures. No more 519. Uh, hello? Brighton Travel Agency? I, uh, I'd like to uh, inquire about a reservation to, um, let's see, uh, uh, to Florida. Yeah. The name? Oh, yes, the name is uh, uh, Charles White. <laughs> There's good news for drivers in recent announcements that new cars are already in production. But there's bad news in the statement of Defense Transportation Director J. Monroe Johnson that it will be at least three years before all the people who want new cars can get them. Three more years. That's a long time to make today's cars last, especially when the average car is already seven years old. It means that now more than ever, your car needs the more thorough, more conscientious kind of service you'll find at Signal gasoline dealers. Yes, there's a very real difference in Signal service, and for two good reasons. You see, being in business for themselves, Signal dealers have made car care their specialty. They're experienced. They know cars. 
And two, because independent signal dealers are in that business not just for today, but permanently. They're eager to please you so well, you come back regularly and be their steady customer. Added up, that assures you the kind of service that will keep your car happy and you satisfied. The kind of service that makes it well worth your while getting acquainted with your neighborhood signal gasoline dealer. And now, back to the whistler. Yes, murder can strike anywhere, even among quiet, drab little people like Arthur Winslow. He has no way of knowing it, of course, as he buys a first-class reservation on the train to Florida. His only thought now is that this will be escape at last. New clothes, new luggage, a new name, and a new life. No 519 tonight, Arthur. It's the 730 to Florida and Waypoint. Oh, uh, which way is the dining car, waiter? Yeah, the three cars back. Oh, thank Better you. Better hurry along. Yes. Yeah. Call for dinner. Okay. Oh! Oh, oh I'm oh. sorry. Oh, that's, that's quite all right. It isn't either. I wasn't looking. Well, neither was I. Where is it? Uh, what? The book. Book? Book? Oh, yes, the book. I knocked it out of your hand. It must be down here on the floor. Oh, here, let me. It's probably down under the no, seat. No, let Let's... me see. I can... Oh, oh, I bumped my head. Oh, <laughs> look at the gum under here. <laughs> ah! Did you get it? Last year's timetable. I've wanted one for ages. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, wait a minute. There it is. Where? To the right, just a little, under the seat. Here, let me... No, let me get it, please. Uh, here we are. That's a fine thing, getting yourself all dusty that way. Uh, uh, turn around. Oh, thanks. <laughs> hmm, moon and sixpence. There we are. That's a little better anyway. Wonderful, isn't it? Hmm? Moon and sixpence. I loved it. Oh, yes, I haven't quite finished it, of course. Do you believe it? I mean, do you think it's right? You mean to toss everything over and take off to the South Seas? Uh, if you don't mind, pal, while you're going to the South Seas, I'll go to dinner. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Excuse me. <laughs> we seem to be holding up traffic. We do, don't we? <laughs> Matter of fact, I was just going into dinner myself. <laughs> so was I. Uh, well, would you consider... Why not? Yes, yeah, why not? <laughs> I think Moon and Sixpence was a wonderful story. Of course, I can't say it was very realistic. Well, what do you mean? Well, I admit it was convincing, but when you stop to think about it, this, um, this running away business... Oh, you you don't believe in it, huh? Well, after all, running away is no solution. Well, sometimes there's uh, nothing else to do. He could have stuck it out. You mean licked it if it took the rest of his life? Yes. Or? Well, all right. All right, he licks it. He found happiness at last. And he's 70. Mm-hmm. Is that all there is to life? Well, I haven't seen too much of I, it yet. I, I but... know it sounds cowardly, but I think there are times when sticking it out for 20 years is wrong. Time doesn't wait, you know. We, we beat our heads against a wall day in, day out. We're tied down to a deadly routine. And then the first thing you know, it, it's too late. No, I, I, I think running away is better than that, don't you? I did once. Oh, I... Uh... Sorry, I didn't mean to. Oh, that's all right. That's quite all right. You see, I did run away. It was just as you said. It was routine, a deadly routine. And when I couldn't stand it any longer, I ran away. Well, what kind of routine was it? Well, perhaps you've heard of my father, Edgar Brewster. Edgar Brewster? Mm Mm-hmm. He's in Miami Beach now, waiting for me. Oh, I see. I'd finally decided to go back and face it, but, uh... Oh, dear. Now you've got me confused again. Oh, I'm sorry if I'd known I... Oh, don't misunderstand. You've really helped me a lot. How do you mean? Well, you seem to know why I did it. It's a kind of uh, moral support. Oh. You're going to Miami? Yes. Uh, oh, by the way, I'm I'm Charles White. I'm Vivian Brewster. Well, perhaps uh, perhaps I'll see you in Miami, huh? I hope so. Yeah, so do I. The daughter of Edgar Brewster. It's fantastic, isn't it, Arthur? You talked with her, had dinner with her. She even said she hoped you'd meet in Miami. But the first week goes by in the hotel, set on the shore looking across Biscayne Bay. It's beautiful. 
But you aren't conscious of anything except Vivian. You wait for a call, but it doesn't come. You begin to realize how ridiculous it is. Of course, she's forgotten about you. You were just someone to talk to, a traveling companion. You can't hide the Jersey commuter under that Palm Beach suit. And then... Hello? Oh, hello. I, I'd like to speak to Miss Vivian Brewster. Speaking? Oh, uh, <laughs> this is Charles White. Well, hello, Mr. White. <laughs> I thought you'd forgotten me by this time. Oh, no, not at all. Uh, <laughs> I, I thought uh, we might have a, a drink together or something. Well, why don't you come out? You mean to your house? Uh -huh, of course. Father would love to meet you. Your father? Yes. What about it? When? Oh, tonight. <laughs> all right, tonight. Well, Arthur, you can hardly believe it, can you? A few days ago, an obscure clerk. Today, sitting with Edgar Brewster, drinking his bourbon. Is that about right, Mr. White? Father's a tightwad with his soda. <laughs> Outrageous way to treat good bourbon. What about it, White? Oh, that looks about right, Mr. Brewster. Yeah, there you are. Oh, thank you. What are you doing in Miami, White? Why, I, uh, I just got a little... Tired of New York. Yeah, you get the right idea. I did the same thing myself 20 years ago. I never went back. <laughs> What's your line? Uh, well, I I was in the, the market, more or less. Yeah, the less, the better these days. Nobody knows where it's going. Hard to figure these war babies. My broker and I were talking today about consolidated plastics. Know anything about it? Yes, a little. What do you think of it? Well, I don't know whether I should say or What's not. What's the matter with it? After all, it's your business, Mr. Brewster. I don't think I'd kid off an opinion. Oh, all right. I'll put it this way. What would you do if you were into it pretty heavily right now? Well, I'd sell out. When? Right now. Any particular reason? Only that I happen to know that stock is being manipulated by a, an inside ring. That it'll take the Securities and Exchange Commission about six months to catch up with them. Why, that's unbelievable. My uh, broker told me... I know, it's, it's only my opinion, Mr. Brewster, but I happen to know that company's financial position. <laughs> you, you asked me what I'd do, and I just told you. You seem to know what you're talking about. <laughs> Investments are my uh, hobby, you might say. I see. May I say something now? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, dear. I forgot you were still with us. I thought so. <laughs> Well, now that you've settled the stock market problem, suppose we get down to the club. The water should be beautiful tonight. What about it? <laughs> oh, I'm afraid it's past my bedtime, dear. You two run along. No place for an old duck like me, anyhow. <laughs> well, Mr. White? Well, Miss Brewster? Oh, what are you waiting for? Get out of here. I'm going to bed. <laughs> And that was the beginning, wasn't it, Arthur? That $1,800 was a magic door opening up a thrilling new life for you. And incidentally, bringing you closer to murder. The next three weeks passed like a dream. More nights at the beach club, dancing in the open under the stars. With Vivian in your arms. Vivian? Yes? Vivian... Why is it you've never asked me about myself, my my background, where I came from? Oh, I don't know. Maybe because it doesn't matter. You know, I, I wasn't going to tell you, but I think perhaps I, I'd better. Will it make any difference? About us? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes, it will make a difference. It'll, it'll make a lot of difference. Well, then don't tell me. I really don't want to know. No, but Vivian, you... Please. Oh, darling... Darling, did I ever tell you I... I like you very much. I'm glad, Charles. I'm so glad. You were in love, Arthur. And for the first time in your life, you knew what it really was. Mr. Brewster began to concern you. He'd never approve in a million years. Or you thought so until that evening he dropped up to your hotel room with a copy of the financial journal in his hand. Look at that, Charles. Oh, what is it? Don't ask silly questions. Look at it, man. Hmm. 
I thought so. Consolidated plastic snowed under in selling rush. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Brewster. I am not. Oh, what do you mean? I took your advice. Sold out three weeks ago. I saved myself a hundred thousand dollars. Well, congratulations. Don't congratulate me. You're the one who deserves it. Uh, you mind if I sit down? Oh, of course not. Here, here you are. Yeah, thank you. Uh, would you be open to a proposition, White? What kind of proposition? Oh, I realize you probably have other interests, but uh, I could make it worth your while, I think. There are two considerations. Yes. The first is the plain fact that my affairs are getting a little beyond me. As you know, I'm retired and haven't time to look after them properly. I think you're the man to take over. But, Mr. Brewster, I... I'm a businessman. If it weren't a profitable deal for me, I wouldn't think of it. I, I see. What's the uh, other consideration? I believe you're aware of that already. Vivian. You uh, approve? I do. <laughs> Uh, may I have time to think this over? Of course. Just let me know in a day or so. There it is, Arthur, brief and to the point. Everything you ever wanted right in the palm of your hand. Open sesame, he said, and there it was. You go into the bar downstairs to think. There's only one thing in your way now, Ethel. You can't run away from that. You've got to make her see your side of it. You've got to go back to her and face it. Make her give you a divorce. You walk out of the bar, through the door, into the hotel lobby. And just as you're rounding the corner by the desk, something stops you in your tracks. This is Ethel Winslow, 5769 Laurel Road, East Orange, New Jersey. Is that all you want? Thank you, madam. Uh... Could I see the register, please? Oh, I'm sorry, madam, but we don't... Well, I, I understand there's a Charles White registered here. Charles? Oh, yes, madam. Uh, room 132. Uh, is he a friend? Uh, yes. Uh, will this help? Oh, well, in that case, I, I, uh, I could give you room 131 next door. The windows open onto the same balcony. Oh, uh, very well. Uh, 131. <laughs> It was too good to last, Arthur. Just a beautiful dream, and you're just waking up. It's all over. Go back in the bar and think. Ethel, your wife, here. She's found you. And she'll never let you go, will she? You know her too well, Arthur. Cold, calculating, heartless. She'd laugh at you, wouldn't she? Yes, sir. Will it be? Bourbon, straight. Right. Uh, just leave the bottle. <laughs> You're beginning to see now, Arthur, what makes a murderer. You couldn't get away from her. Just as Vivian said, you can't solve anything by running away. All you get is a build-up to nothing. Whatever made you think you could talk her into a divorce? There's no other way out, is there, Arthur? You sit in the friendly darkness of the bar all afternoon, late into the evening, thinking, thinking. It's almost 11 when you make up your mind. There's a phone booth near the door. Hello? Hello. Hello, Vivian. Vivian, I have to talk to you. It's important. Why, Charles, what's the matter? Never mind. Just listen to me, yes. Vivian. Just listen. I'm a phony. M my name is Arthur Winslow. I was running away when you met me on the train. I'm just an investment clerk. I have no money. I have nothing. Just $1,800 I won in a horse race. Listen, Vivian, I got a wife in East Orange, New Jersey. I've hated her for 10 years. I'd rather be dead than go back to her. I'm not going back to her. I I'm telling you this, Vivian, because... I love you more than I ever dreamed I, I could love anyone. And I, I probably won't ever see you again. Goodbye, Vivian. Eleven o'clock, Arthur. You've got it all planned. Ethel is asleep in her room, room 131. A balcony connected with yours. It's easy, isn't it, Arthur? Yes, there she is. And she's asleep. You take a firm hold on the heavy brass candlestick you picked up from the mantel in your room. A blunt instrument, the police will say. 
You can hardly breathe, Arthur. Your stomach is full of ice water. You feel your heart's going to burst. Careful, Arthur. Careful. Whistler will return in just a moment with the strange ending of tonight's story. Meantime, a word about teeth and tires. They have a good deal in common, you know. For the good of your teeth, you see your dentist twice a year so he can catch small cavities before they grow big and endanger the tooth. And for the good of your tires, it's equally important to have your signal gasoline dealer inspect them regularly so any small injuries can be repaired before they spread and ruin the carcass or so he can warn you before your tread is worn too thin for proper retreading. You'll find your signal gasoline dealer is completely equipped to give you the finest in modern tire repair, whether it's a small patch or a full recap. For those friendly dealers displaying signals, yellow and black circle sign, are much more than just a place to get signal go-farther gasoline and fine signal double-check lubrication. Each signal dealer offers a complete line of automotive services and fine accessories to help your car run better, look better, and last longer. Now, back to the Whistler. No, Arthur, when the cards were down, you couldn't do it. The wife you hated for ten years at your mercy and you couldn't do it. But you came close enough to see what makes a murderer. And now you're standing over her. I can't. I I can't do it. Uh, 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 I'm I'm sorry, Ethel. I'm sorry I woke you up. Turn the light on. Don't stand there. Yes, Ethel. Hand me my other slipper. Yes, sir. Well, you thought you could get by with it, didn't you? No, no, Ethel, I, I, I didn't. Don't deny it. I know what's been going on, and I can prove it, you, you philanderer. Ethel, I tell you, I... What, what did you say? Well, I have a complete report on your activities for the last month. You weren't very clever, Arthur. The detectives say you left a trail a child could follow. What are you getting at, Ethel? Joe? Joe? Listen, there's someone knocking on your door. A woman. Ethel, come back. Where are you going? Miss Brewster. Oh, oh Vivian. A pretty picture. And you have the crust to ask me what I'm getting at. I've known about Miss Brewster all along. In fact, we've had a little talk. And for your information, Arthur, I'm leaving for Reno in the morning. In view of what's happening, I don't think you'll feel it's wise to contest the case. Contest it? We've waited five years for a chance like this. We? Mr. Dinwiddie and I. Miss, Mr. Dinwiddie. <laughs> Mr. Dinwiddie. (laughs) Arthur, what in the world were you doing with that brass candlestick? Monday at 9 o'clock, The Whistler will bring you another strange tale. The Whistler is broadcast for your entertainment by the marketers of Signal Gasoline and Motor Oil and fine quality automotive accessories and by your neighborhood signal dealer. This program directed by George W. Allen with tonight's story by Everett Tomlinson and Harold Swanton, music by Wilbur Hatch, is transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking and suggesting that you let every traffic signal remind you that you do go farther with signal gasoline. Yes, you do go farther with signal. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.